Hello everybody, come in, make yourself comfortable. We're gonna get started in about a minute from now. Welcome along to our webinar for the day. See a few people coming in, so make yourself comfortable. We'll get started in about 30 seconds. We're going to, going to kick it off, try and get away on time. So welcome everybody to our webinar on 2020 financial strategies. My name's Jeff Thurek. I'm one of the directors of Evalesco Financial Services, and I'm joined today by my fellow director and good mate, Marshall Brentnell. Welcome along, Marsh. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you for having me. Well so hosted I'm, so far. I'm coming to you uh, live from Evalesco HQ. Marsh was going to be joining me here, but uh, he decided to uh, call in from home. Um, with a bit of a croaky voice, so uh, hopefully his voice holds up for the duration. Fingers crossed. <laughs> it was also a nice opportunity to, to welcome some of the broader Evalesco family to my home. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> I might see uh, Frankie walking past the dog at some stage if she's, she's around. She's having a snooze at the moment, but if you see a big Weimarana, that's, that's Frankie. Very good. Um, so today's agenda, we're going to go through the tried and trusted financial strategies that have been working for our clients over a long time. We're going to talk a little bit about the investment philosophy of AAN and Evalesco and have a bit more of a deep dive into the AAN model portfolios as well. Before we do that, um, the general advice disclaimer. So just a reminder that the information that we're going to provide in this webinar is general and factual information only. We haven't taken into account your personal financial circumstances. Um, if we talk about something today that you think is of interest to you and you'd like to discuss further, please get in touch with your advisor or Marshall and I, and we'd be happy to do that. We will welcome you to ask questions along the way through today as well. So if you'd like to do that, you can click on the Q&A uh, tab down the bottom there, and that will give you the opportunity to type in some questions. So you, you will be on mute for the duration as a, as a uh, registered guest today, so you won't be able to talk to us, but please do type in any questions. We'll answer some of them along the way through, uh, and any we don't get to, we can um, come back to at the end of the session. So please fire away with those questions. So as I said, today we're gonna to start off with talking about as, as per the, uh, the title of the webinar, the trusted financial strategies. And we thought a good way, when Marsh and I were preparing, we thought a good way to start this would be to use a tried and trusted slide that we've been using for presentations and talking mm. to clients about for the last uh, 10 or 12 years or so, which is the simple steps for creating wealth. And we find that these are still really important strategies. Um, so Marsh, what is it about these simple steps do you think that, that are important and still continue to be relevant? I think, uh, there's a couple of aspects to this, Jeff. Um, I mean, firstly, I think most people would feel comfortable when you read through that list. You know, they're, they're tenants that have been passed down for, for generations, really. And they're strategies that are within most people's comfort zone. So you know, looking from one through eight there, you know, a fundamental basis behind creating financial outcomes is consistently spending less than you earn. Now, whether you're a business or an individual, if you're, if you're spending more than you earn for a long period of time, then certainly not too many options are going to become available to you. But if you're consistently spending less than you earn, then you can start to look at some of the other options as you cascade down the list. So consistently spending less than you earn and investing the difference in good quality assets. Um, looking to acquire your own home and slowly but methodically repaying that home loan debt. So 
owning your own home, it's, it's certainly not for everybody, but in our experience, um, it creates discipline and certainly for savings. And it's one of the foundation pieces behind many of our financial plans. Um, you know, we find that once clients are in a position where they're consistently um, spending less than they earn, they're putting a little bit more money into their home mortgage, then you can start to look at other strategies, you know, regularly investing into uh, a share portfolio, preparing yourself for potentially owning an investment property, um, looking at, you know, consistently and regularly topping up your superannuation savings. Um, and I guess the final one there being putting in place a protection mechanism should something happen to you. Yeah. And do you think, has it been, you know, given what's been going on in the world and the volatility and, and other challenges, are these simple steps still holding, holding, holding their own? Are these still the strategies that clients are exercising and, and um, we're recommending to clients? Mm. I think more than ever. I mean, Jeff, if we go back to when we first started our partnership, we we took on a number of clients that um, really hadn't adhered to a number of these steps. You know, they were introduced to us when a, a business was closing um, and they had large levels of, of investment debt. They had portfolios that, uh, with once again, with, with large borrowings that weren't earning any income and there was some real levels of anxiety and a lack of peace of mind throughout the GFC for those clients. Yeah. But over a number of years, we slowly but surely worked through um, and supported those clients to make sure that, you know, they were adhering to these principles of one through eight. And if I were to think about, you know, the number of phone calls or the level of communication we received throughout um, the, the period of February to March, it was dramatically down on our experience in the GFC because our clients, they'd consistently been putting some money aside for the rainy day. There were minimal, if any, borrowings associated with any equities or shares that they had. So there was no margin calls being made. Um, and they, they, they didn't have anxiety. There was peace of mind around their position and they felt that they had a plan. So, you know, once again, periods of volatility like this reinforces why the simple strategies of one through eight make a difference. Yeah, absolutely. I think you're right. It comes back to, you know, I was just reflecting my memory. You're talking, having the simple things, it's not rocket science and sometimes it's a bit boring sticking to these simple strategies, but they stand the test of time. And um, there was some, I guess, overly complicated products and, and strategies mm. in place through the start of the GFC. And that was certainly some of the lessons that we learned was, you know, to, to avoid those uh, heavily engineered products, to avoid those things with um, lots of gearing and stick to the simple things. And that's been fantastic for, for our clients over the last um, 10 or 12 years. Mm. Agreed. Probably the one area where we're going to, we are going to focus on a little bit more is, is the one where we talk about the professionally managed share portfolio. Yeah, the rest of the strategies, it's great to get some guidance around your, your borrowings. It's great to get the support of somebody who's an expert in the property space. Um, certainly super can be complicated, but um, you know, it's not, not overly um, challenging to work out the right, mm. right smart super strategies, but the professionally managed share portfolio was the one where we found um, there are some benefits to paying um, for that advice and and I guess there are some more complicating factors there so that's the one we're going to focus on a little bit more as we go through today. Um, before we jump into that this is another of the slides that, that any of our clients on, on the uh, call today have probably seen you know various versions of this slide um, talking about the foundations of our plan. Are there any key points you wanted to, to raise before we move on to this one much? Yeah I I think if we you know start from from top down, and you know every client scenario is different, but and I'm I'm hoping this resonates uh, that the messaging that regardless of whether or not um, in our business whether it's Jeff or myself that have supported you or one of our other advisors that we're very much at all times focused on making sure that you've got enough cash put aside to do what's important to you and to manage. I guess you're spending throughout periods such as this, 
Now, certainly we weren't expecting a pandemic to be rolled out in early 2020, but it's for very much reasons like this that we strongly encourage clients to have you know, three to six months worth of personal spending just sitting in cash. And sometimes it feels lazy to have that, but you know, we haven't had too many calls from clients upset about the fact that they've had too much cash at this time because it's allowed them to take a step back from the headlines and not feel as though that, you know, they're significantly pressured. Um, you know, going down that, that list, you know, once the cash buckets are taken care of, once again, we want to make sure that our clients are living in a home that they're happy to come home to each and every day they're slowly but surely repaying that home loan. Um, outside of that, there's got to be a plan to consistently build that passive or nest egg strategy. And if you have an investment property, at some point in time, you know that needs to get repaid so that it can actually sit in that passive category. So there's actually no property line on that one there. But most of our clients that are approaching retirement, you'll find that they'll have uh, a superannuation nest egg, a, a, put, a professionally managed share portfolio, and ideally they'll have an investment property that's debt free as well, Jeff. Yeah, that's right. I think coming back to your point about the cash, we had probably more clients say to us over the last few months. Now I understand what you've been saying all those years about why mm. you need to have that three to six months worth of cash buffer, which yeah. is, which has been, yeah, quietly reassuring that yep. um, the message is getting through now. And yeah, as you said, we don't hope for times like this, but it's when those simple things do, do really shine through. No. Uh, I agree because I certainly received a few calls from clients wanting to increase regular savings plans. Um, you know, I, I didn't receive a call, one call uh, in relation to a client that had a, a geared share portfolio because we've got very few, few of those. So there's no anxiety or stress around that, which was reassuring. Um, so moving on to that, yeah, I guess the building the managed portfolio and, the, and this talks about some of the factors that contribute to delivering good outcomes in that space of building that professionally managed portfolio. Um, so we've got fees, which is something that is, is often top of mind and one of the first ports of call for people to think about. Um, asset allocation, which is really the, the mix of assets that you have. Um, whether that be property or shares or cash, um, contributions and drawings. So how much you're putting into an asset, putting into a plan or how much you're taking out when you're in retirement. And then a big one is the behaviour and, and how you're, I guess, controlling your, your impact on that portfolio through your own behaviour. Yeah, so this, this slide is, is one that we use on a regular basis. And I, I think we've, we've added one of the bubbles over the last 12 months. Um, but it's something that uh, just demonstrates that, you know, there isn't a magic solution out there to delivering better outcomes with portfolios and to deliver more peace of mind to clients. It's really just about focusing on what we can actually control. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you start with making sure that the money that's being invested, it's invested based on, I guess, the, the time frames and the priorities for the client. So, if we were to go back a couple of slides where we talked about having enough cash buckets set aside for rainy days and emergencies, that then allows us to put more money in that, for example, the dark blue bucket into things that are long-term in nature because the clients have that peace of mind knowing that money's sitting there for them. Um, certainly at all times, we're seeking to drive down the costs of the administrators that we use, of the investment managers that we use as well. Um, and to consistently encourage our clients to be growing what they're putting into their superannuation and wealth strategies and at times to minimize what's being taken out. So a number of clients took advantage of um, the government's reduction in the pension allowance started on the 1st of July, which means that they're going to be drawing less from their savings, which ideally means that it's going to last longer. Um, and the final one there is around managing behavior. And whilst there was um, a number of calls that we received throughout the last quarter and a half as a result of the volatility, uh, far and away, most of our clients feel comfortable because we've increased communication throughout this period. 
to make sure that they're maintaining the right strategy and right behaviours and they've stayed invested throughout this period. Yeah. And we've got some slides later which will show the, the benefits of how that's, I guess, being repaid through that um, patience and um, sticking to the long-term plan, which we'll go through. Mm -hmm. um, we just had our first question come through um, all the way from New York City. So uh, thank you, Marty, for your question. Thanks for joining us and staying up late. Um, Marty was asking in relation to the, um, I guess, point about managing your borrowings wisely. He just flagged that in the States they've got um, really record low interest rates at the moment and a lot mm. of clients have benefited from the ability to refinance and restructure their lending um, to take advantage of that. I'm wondering whether we're having a similar um, opportunity here and um, certainly is the case, Marty. We, we've got, you know, for the first time in, in our professional lives, you know, interest rates with a starting with a two available, so two point something um, for loans and we've seen uh, a lot of clients um, saving a lot of money through through getting the lending structure right, but also accessing the right um, interest rates on their products. We've got a story coming out in our news newsletter this afternoon, which is uh, um, highlights that perfectly. Where you know, won't do too much of a spoiler, but the clients are saving about um, seventeen and a half thousand dollars a year, um, which adds up to you know close to four hundred thousand mm. dollars over the life of the loan. So there are some fantastic opportunities, and that means that it's easier to spend less than you earn, which you can then put some more money into those growth assets and those strategies or super contributions and those types of things. So that's, that's working really well. So moving on to talking a bit more, Marsh, this is, there's a few more uh, bubbles on, on this slide. There are. To go through. This is where we're getting into a little bit more of the technical side of things, but talking about the investment philosophy. So we, we've talked about growth assets. We've talked about professionally managed portfolios. Um, but I thought it was a good opportunity as, as you've been instrumental in helping us to build these um, model portfolios over the last three or four years um, in conjunction with our colleagues at AAN. Um, so I thought it'd be a good opportunity to talk in some detail about what, what's the philosophy that goes in behind building those portfolios and what are some of the key um, factors that, that you focus on at an investment committee level and how they play out for our clients. Okay, sure. Thanks, Jeff. Um, so I guess this slide, certainly there are more bubbles on it. Um, and as many of you would know, I wear, I guess, two different hats within the business. So certainly I'm an advisor first and foremost, but I also sit on the investment committee along with um, a number of other directors of our license. And I guess as a result of our, our learnings and experiences, um, you know, collectively there's probably more than 100 years of, face-to-face um, -face experience in delivering advice to clients, but also, um, I guess, working throughout fairly volatile periods. And we've learned some lessons along the way. And the first lesson that um, is perhaps very important is that if you have, I guess, five different businesses within our license, each doing their own thing, it's very hard for us to deliver a consistent outcome for clients. And that's where all of this sort of comes down to is that blue bubble in the middle. What we're trying to do is build a methodology and series of strategies that will allow us to be, to deliver more reliable outcomes through good times and volatile times for our clients. And the other dots that, that circulate around outcomes are some of the things that we feel are really important that need to be addressed in the way in which we manage money. So if I think about the yellow one, we've talked about asset allocation before. That's just all about making sure that we have enough money set aside for, for the rainy day and for several years worth of spending for retirees. And the rest of the money, we make sure that it's invested with long-term strategies in mind. Now, once we've determined what the right allocation should be, we then think about some of the other levers that are important to us. Now, certainly we all like to drive down the costs associated with our investments, but there's other things that you might not consider uh, required. Now, some of these stem back to some of the stories that Jeff and I were sharing around the GFC, and they've resurfaced yet again over the last six months where, where certain funds have made it difficult 
for investors to access their portfolio. So that's talking about liquidity. We want to make sure that at all times, our clients are able to access their investments and they're not frozen out of their portfolios. We feel it's important that clients are able to actually see what's in the investment portfolio. So there's complete transparency. And that's one of the reasons why we've started to use these strategies called managed accounts. Because that means when you log on to your portfolio, you can see the underlying securities and shares that you're actually invested in. So that if you are reading about a potential vaccine being, being developed by CSL, you can see whether or not you're invested in that portfolio. But at an investment committee level, we feel that it's very important that we can see what's under the hood because we wanna make sure that there are no surprises in either the good times or the bad. Now, one of the other aspects about the way in which we manage money that we feel is really important is this concept of rebalancing. Mm -hmm. Now, when you invest money and if it's a set and forget type portfolio, you'll ride the market up and you'll ride the market down. And sometimes you would have all heard stories where investors have fallen in love with a particular strategy. What we've wanted to do and what we do consistently do is create a series of processes so that each and every quarter we rebalance our portfolios back to their strategic benchmarks. That removes any behavioral biases that kind of sneak in when we fall in love with something in particular. And it also manages risk really consistently. And we've got some scenarios that will, or some real life scenarios that we'll walk through shortly. So when you say strategic benchmarks, Marsh, what, what does that mean? So um, typically when we're building a portfolio for a client and um, most, most investors will have gone through what's called a, a risk profile. And you may come out as a balanced investor or a growth based investor. And what that means is we've, we've created a series of models that align to those profiles. So if you're a, a growth based investor, that typically means you have about 85% of your portfolio in Australian shares and international shares and a little bit of property. Mm -hmm. The balance is in defensive strategies. So each quarter, if the Australian shares have had a really good run and they've gone their, their percentage has increased, we will modestly sell that down and bring it back to the target level and deploy that money across other things that might not have done so well. So that we're consistently banking the wins when we can and we're topping up those that perhaps have underperformed for a particular reason. Yeah. So you, you often hear the cliche, you know, best investors sell high and buy low. That's a really hard thing to do in terms of you know, if you're going to be doing it behaviorally, trying to pick the right time and do it at an individual level. So with the rebalancing and having a, I guess, a consistent approach to how that's rolled out, that's what you're doing. Because if it's gone up, like you just said in that example, then you're selling some of those assets at a higher point and you'll be buying into assets which haven't gone up as much or they might have gone down over that period of time. Hmm. Correct. Yep. Um, and what about consistency? Talk us about how that fits into the philosophy. Yeah, so this is, I mean, it's, it's very much linked to that blue bucket as well around outcomes because um, there's, there's two tiers to this. So firstly, if I think about the investment committee, I wanna make sure that all investors, I guess within the Evalesco family and the AN family, they receive a consistent investment outcome. So no longer should, um, an investor that's more timely with their paperwork receive a better rate of return than, than someone who perhaps is a little bit tardy with their paperwork. We wanna make sure that on any given day, if we need to make a strategic change, we can deliver that to all clients at the one time. That makes sense. Yep. Um, so, I mean, there, there's been a few examples of that over the years and um, certainly when we started to, to utilize the models, um, there was a, a portfolio manager that we used on a regular basis and they, they had um, a, a very significant change within their business where all of the key portfolio managers left and started up their own, their own business. Now, we were faced with the position of um, what do we do there? We, we, we don't have a relationship with those managers that are managing that portfolio and we don't have 
a high degree of confidence that they will be able to deliver consistent outcomes as the portfolio managers had done before. So we made a, a decision to transfer those monies to, uh, or to rather to appoint a new investment manager. And that was done within a 24 hour period. Um, and that's also one of the reasons why we're consistently reviewing uh, other managers that sit on our reserve bench because you never know what is around the corner. Yeah, no, that's good. So we might move on and show a couple of examples which will then reinforce mm. some of the, the key points and how they play out in practice. Um, touching on you know what's been done since February in these particularly volatile times. And I, I spoke about this a little bit when uh, in the webinar uh, last month with Francine from Franklin Templeton, where we talked about the professional managers have in the main not done a lot in the last you know, quarter. They haven't been overly reactive um, because they've had a good plan and they've stuck to that plan and delivered on those good quality assets. And I think you know, we haven't been sitting idle in the end of the committee, we haven't been sitting idle, but there hasn't been a lot that's needed to be done because there's been a lot of work to position the portfolio as well. Um, having said that, be good to touch on the you know the few key sort of actions that have been taken over the last quarter or so. Okay, so um, yeah, I've, I've outlined five different things there, and I'll once again I'll, I'll go from top to bottom. So there was a tremendous amount of volatility from I think it was about February twenty through till the end of March. Markets sort of fell in the range of about thirty to thirty five percent, which is a significant fall, but it was really on the back of um, a lack of information as to you know what the consequences of COVID were going to be, and mm. markets do overreact both ways, and they certainly reacted very strongly in the negative in that in that situation. So, as an investment committee, we we stuck to our process, and what that meant was that towards the end of March, we effectively looked at all of the portfolios that we manage, and for those areas that had done particularly well, relatively speaking that would be cash and fixed income and, and fairly defensive strategies. We reduced those a little and reallocated those monies back to those strategies that had fallen, which was Australian and international shares. Now, certainly at that time, um, um, if we'd have gone individual by individual, I'm sure a number of clients may have felt a little bit uneasy about that process of deploying more money into something that had fallen. But, we, we have a process that um, has been consistently applied on a quarterly basis now for, for several plus years. And this evidence was, I mean, this, this action that we undertook clearly demonstrated the importance of it because not long after we deployed those monies, the monies or the, the markets have rallied to almost back to market highs in a relatively short period of time. And it just demonstrates the importance of um, not allowing the headlines to sometimes guide your investment principles. Um, I think the next couple of point out that that yeah that wasn't done because the investment committee thought the markets were about to take off or they were trying no, to no. the market. That was done based on a consistent philosophy, wasn't it? Which we talked about in that that last slide, which is about the rebalancing happens because we want to get back to strategic benchmarks. Correct. And as a result, at the end of the next quarter, because markets had recovered, there's a likelihood that there might be a sale of some of the assets in the equities portion because they caught up to you know, and exceeded the benchmarks, perhaps. Yeah, so for example, the uh, quarter just ended as a result of a very strong rally in Australian shares and international shares. Those positions were trimmed and yeah. we, we topped up some of the defensive strategies. So uh, it just demonstrates that um, if you have a, a set and forget strategy where you review things once a year, I think that some uh, better outcomes can be delivered as a result of more of a, uh, I guess, a systematic approach where you rebalance on a quarterly basis. Yep. Okay. Um, outside of that, there's been a number of other strategies that we've had on the go. Um, so certainly there's been investments that we've wanted to add into the portfolios but we haven't been able to do so because of the strong run that we've had for the last period. There was some substantial gains in there. We really didn't want those to flow through to investors. 
But at the end of March, because of the significant falls, it allowed us to, to put into some of the models uh, some lower cost strategies, thereby delivering on one of our tenets of reducing fees where we could, but to do it at a time that it wasn't going to be expensive from a taxation viewpoint. So we're selling at a time where there was minimal, if any, capital gains that would flow through to investors. Um, the other thing that we rolled out there is item three. So on the investment committee, there are, there are five directors that sit on that and we meet once per month. Now, throughout this period of COVID, we're effectively um, you know, meeting once a week and we're having regular dial-ins throughout that period. We have a, an independent that sits on the committee, plus also we receive advice from two external consultants. Now, some of that advice related to reviewing how we manage the currency within the portfolios and the Australian dollar had fallen substantially. It had fallen, I think, to about 55 US cents or, or thereabouts. And so we put in place a strategy of hedging half of our international portfolio. And this goes back to one of our other tenets of equally weighting the strategies and not falling in love with one particular method of managing money. So that's, that's benefited our clients immensely because the Aussie dollar has since rallied fairly strongly and it's you know, sort of sitting at late 60s or, or thereabouts, which has protected our client portfolio. So that's sort of just some of the tactical things that we do. And we haven't really been able to do that for the last couple of years because of um, the strength of the dollar at that time. Okay, that's good. In the interest of time, we might move on and, and sort of talk a bit now more about some of the uh, examples and, and some model portfolios. Um, okay. So That's good. So on the, the next couple of slides that we have here, we've um, these are these are actual real live client scenarios and clearly the, the personal particulars have been redacted, but there I've got two demonstrations here. This this client is a is effectively in a growth style portfolio. So on the bottom left-hand corner there, you can see the pie chart. And if we tally that portfolio up, it's likely to come to about 85 to 88% investments in um, shares and property and the balance in more conservative style assets. Now the rates of return in this time period that we're assessing here is over a 12 month period. So this is to 30 June. And you can see that if you could highlight that 5.36% um, figure there, Jeff. Yeah. So even after the market correction of 30 to 35%, which occurred between February and March and the subsequent rally, this client is still up over 5% for that 12 month period, which is I think a really, really positive outcome. And it's a conversation advisors in our team are having with clients that are often surprised that they're in the black after such a volatile period. So this is some of the transparency that you'll see. And if we flick over to the, the next slide, Jeff, um, keep in mind this bottom right-hand corner, and we've got a graph there over a 12 month period where with this client in the blue line, their portfolio of effectively 85% invested in the share market has been able to track above a similar investment in the Australian share market. So the green line is the 200 largest businesses in the stock exchange and the blue line is the portfolio. So you can see that um, we've captured all of the upside. There's a bit of a gap there as the markets move forward, but we haven't also haven't fallen as heavily, but have bounced out of the, the trough quite strongly. And some of that is as a result of um, the rebalancing. Some of that is just market exuberance. Um, and some of it is the selection of the right investment managers that are doing their thing. So if you look on that bottom left figure there, Jeff, it can clearly demonstrate that the 5.36% uh, delivered outcome over a 12 month period is certainly superior to what the Australian Stock Exchange has done over that 12 month period. Now, there's Marsh on the, on the downside. One of the, the bubbles on the uh, philosophy side was about managing risk. So, you know, one of the key focuses is you know, not losing money where possible. Mm. Obviously, when you take on risk, there's always, um, in seeking reward, there's always a risk of losing some money. But if you can lose less, then you've got much less work to do. 
um, to, to make that money back. And that's you know, been shown to, to have worked in this scenario, which has been pleasing. And it, I mean, if I, if I went back uh, 12 to 18 months as well, there was a, another period where this type of a scenario played out quite well. And that was towards the end of 2018. I think there was some substantial drops in that period of the market bounced out of that. So it's just where this consistent methodical approach does pay dividends. Yeah. Um, so the, so this is where we talk about transparency and this is the, just the first slide of, of several where you can actually see the underlying investments within the portfolio. And the majority of these line items here, they're just Australian shares that this investor um, has an allocation to ranging from the A2 milk company to baby bunting to ARB that make bull bars and a whole range of other investments within there. But transparency from an investment committee viewpoint, and we've also found from a client viewpoint creates peace of mind because you know what you're invested in and it allows for greater levels of comfort and peace of mind as a result. I think a couple of the other um, things that the transparency has shown is, you know, the ability to tailor portfolios within that professional management space as well. So you've still got the benefit of having professional management, but we can bet we're able to adjust to any specific preferences uh, for clients. And, and one of the key areas we've seen is a few clients have had, um, I guess, ethical and, and moral consideration around some of the assets they do or don't want to hold. Um, as an example, we have some clients in, in our um, client base who, who are um, not keen on investing in um, businesses like Crown Resorts because of their focus on gambling or mm. um, other you know, miners potentially that may be in the portfolio. So with this transparency, you're able to see what, what's in the portfolio and you can actually put a lock on or say, we're not going to invest in those and exclude those from the portfolio. So that's been an interesting addition to, to our capabilities and, and that's led to, um, you know, I guess, being able to do something about the conversations we've been having with clients who come in and say, look, I, I would like to have an eth ethical tilt to, to my investment philosophy personally. Um, so we've seen a you know, fairly good demand for that, Marsh, which has led to mm -hmm. you know, the construction of uh, a specific portfolio focused on that, which is about to be available to clients in the coming months. Yeah, it has. So that's, uh, that's been a little baby of mine that we've been slowly but surely building. And I think we've got a slide on that, which we'll touch on. Yeah. Um, so the other, the other part of the transparency, which I do talk to clients about, and I had a, had a good chat with a client yesterday, is sometimes the transparency creates too much information and, and a bit of confusion. So when you're used to looking at a you know, report on your super fund and you've got a couple of lines and it you know, shows you the performance and it shows you the growth and the, the income, then you look at a slide like this or, or a report from, from premium on these portfolios and mm. you've got so much information there. It can be confusing. Um, so, you know, we're happy to always talk through that. And, and there are some summary slides as well, which can, you know, as, as per that previous one, which is going to give you the headline numbers, um, which can be useful. But if you do want to look in more detail, it's available. So that's about the ability to tailor, I guess, the reporting and the information there to not overwhelm anyone. That's not the purpose of having that transparency. No, correct. We've, I've put uh, an alternate uh, example here. Now, this, this investor is, is more conservative and they're a, a retiree. So the first investor was someone uh, that was growing their portfolio in the accumulation phase, whereas this client is in the retiree phase. So you can see on the bottom left-hand corner, rather than had, having 85% invested in shares and property, this client has probably closer to about between 65 and 70% invested in the share market and property. So much more conservative, a third of their investments in defensive strategies. So one of the reasons why I wanted to show this is just because you, you don't have an appetite for as much risk, it doesn't mean that we can't deliver some outcomes for you if we manage the portfolio as well. So, the, the earlier client received a portfolio return of a little bit over five. Um, this client has much more conservatively invested, but they've re still received an outcome of over 4%, which I think is a great outcome. And reassuringly, once again, we've got that big gap between um, the blue line and the green line there. Okay. 
Yeah, and, and I think it's it's interesting. You would expect that a more more conservative portfolio would have a bigger gap when the markets are falling. Um, but it's interesting that there's a gap there on the way up as well. So it shows that you know having the right types of assets and having those professionally managed and that rebalancing is a good way of um, understanding you can participate in the upside, but definitely reducing your downside, which is fantastic. Yeah. The other thing that I would share there, Jeff, and I, I didn't include it on this slide because it would have made it look too busy. Um, but for those that are more technically minded, we could have plotted some of the international share market indexes and they would have effectively tracked very similar or almost in line with our portfolios themselves. So we've been able to deliver outcomes that are in line with the international share market, but well ahead of ours, but with much less risk. Yeah. Um, so we've got about five minutes to go. So if anyone has questions, now would be a good time to, um, to uh, fire away with your question. So go to the Q&A tab and, and type those in there um, and let us know if you've got any other questions. But in the meantime, we'll keep, keep going through the slides. Um, so what's happening next in terms of the portfolios and what the investment committee is, is working on? Yeah, so I mean, th there's a few different aspects to this and certainly, you know, each and every day we're having conversations with the managers that sit within the portfolios and we're finding that there are, there's more and more consistency around the feedback from them in terms of where they think things are headed. So it's possibly going to go one of three ways is the consistent feedback that we're getting. Firstly, it's going to be more of the same for an extended period. Um, that means there's going to be more stimulus put into the system, uncertainty around a vaccine, um, you know, contagion rates are going to rise and fall. That's kind of option one. Now, under that scenario, some of the growth stocks should do a little bit better. But the other scenarios, scenario two is perhaps the one that seems a little bit more reassuring. And that's where a COVID vaccine is rolled out sooner rather than later. Better treatment protocols are put in place and certainly more contact tracing. Um, so under that scenario, there'll be more certainty for investors. Um, and I think that you'll see our portfolios perform quite well in that space because they're generally quite defensive in nature. Um, the scenario three that we, we hear a little bit, and, and this is the one that's the more challenging one, and that's kind of the curveball that you don't really know what's around the corner. You know, could COVID mutate in some way, shape or form? Um, could there be some international event, you know, these things uh, are very, very difficult to predict. Um, but, but once again, there are some strong defensive aspects to each of the diversified bottles that we run, which I feel quite confident will, will stand the test of time once again. Um, so in the last two minutes, we've, we've had a couple of uh, good comments come through. Um, Another one from Marty from NYC, um, which is very, which is oh. great. Yeah, um, just commenting on on the consideration of um, cash as an investment asset as well, and how we do we do include that in the portfolio. And when you know markets are running strongly, it's hard to keep that cash and hold your discipline there. But that's where that regular rebalancing comes in and making sure we've got the right levels exposed to those assets. Um, thanks for that. And we've got one more. Uh, question come through from uh, from us. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll give you a call and have a chat about that one. Russ, it might be a slightly lengthier conversation. So uh, thanks for that question. Um, so I guess in closing, Marsh, we've got some points up there about the, the sustainable growth model, which we, we, we touched on, um, which is something which we can share a little bit more over the, the um, coming months as that becomes available to clients, but for, for those who are interested in, in thinking about um, transparency and um, sustainability in investment, that's something that, that we'll have available very soon after a lot of hard work. It's been a lot of hard work going into that, believe <laughs> me. Uh, I mean, the one thing that I would say is that, um, you know, it, it's taken us a long time to, uh, to roll something like this out, but the main reason is that 
we wanted to make sure that we could deliver outcomes to our clients that um, certainly delivered on the sustainable approach, but we're also, we're very confident that we will deliver on the investment outcomes as well. So um, that's kind of to that point, number one, we wanted to make sure that by rolling out a strategy that provided clients with peace of mind in the sustainable space, it wasn't going to deliver substandard investment outcomes. Yeah, fantastic. All right, so we've come to the end. We, we've had a couple of other questions come through, but we can take those off offline as well. So thank you for those questions. Um, I'd just like to thank everybody for your uh, participation today. Thank you, Marsh, for your comments and, and your uh, hard work for the investment committee and um, delivering those great outcomes for our clients. Um, keep up the good work. Um, this presentation will be available um, via our newsletter, which will be coming out this afternoon and, and also posted on our events page on our website uh, in the coming days. So if you want a refresher uh, or just want to watch the highlights again, then um, knock yourself out there. Uh, if you do have any questions, uh, please feel free to come to us, either Marshall or I, or to your advisor. Uh, we would welcome your feedback as well. So thanks again for participating and, um, and for giving us your time and enjoy your day. Sounds good. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks so much. Thank you all.